what every Adventist scientist should know about radiometric dating. We've been doing a series on what every scientist, Adventist scientist should know. We've discussed the philosophy of science. Uh, we've discussed is there a God? We still have to redo the origin of life eventually um, because it didn't get recorded, but uh, we'll try to correct that. Um, and uh, the question of how old is life on Earth, we've been through all of those subjects. And um, finally, uh, we're coming to challenges to young life creationism and something that's a little bit off of the creation evolution <coughs> controversy, Ellen White's health messages. We talked about the general health messages yes, uh, last week, and we're going to talk about alcohol in the near future. Uh, today, we're going to talk about radiometric dating, and next week we'll be on ice cores. Radiometric dating, there's some general considerations I have to uh, point out. One of them is we can't review all of radiometric dating in 40 minutes. Uh, it's impossible. So we're going to be kind of selective, and I'm going to give you some guides as to how selective we're going to be. I'm going to give you some references. Obviously, just giving references would run us out of 40 minutes. Um, certainly annotated references would. And um, so probably our best bet is to give you reviews that will have a lot of uh, references in them. And then after that, um, kind of turn you loose to find others on your own. I'm going to talk about the methods themselves so you know what we're talking about. I'm going to talk about their usual use and at the same time problems that they have. Um, again, this is going to be general and brief. If you want more detail, I suggest you go to some of the selected references to give you some ideas as to um, you know, the math involved and stuff, stuff like that. I'm going to talk about data that is usually ignored. And then I'm going to give you my take. And then, of course, um, you can give uh, your reaction. So. I'm going to give you some selected references. The first one I'm going to give you is a 1991 book by Brent Dalrymple. It's probably unique in that Brent Dalrymple is an authority on radiometric dating in general and potassium argon dating in particular. Um, <coughs> having written a textbook that's uh, still referred to as one of the uh, better textbooks on potassium argon dating, Dalrymple and Lanfear. Um, but uh, he wrote you know, a book called The Age of the Earth in 1991, which was a specific answer to creationism. Um, so uh, of course, the creationism he attacked is not exactly identical to that which most Adventists believe in. But, um, but there were enough cross uh, references that I think that it's worth looking at. If you want to see the other side presented polemically, that's the place to start. Uh, if you want to see it presented to the people who just do it normally, without the polemics, you can go to Gunter Fare, Principles of Isotope Geology, or the more modern Gunter Fare and Teresa Mensing, um, 2005, Isotopes, Principles, and Applications. Um, both of which are very good, and uh, both of which kind of play things more or less straight down the middle, at least as far as they see things. Um, Mabus Guy and uh, Helmut Schleicher uh, wrote a book called Absolute Dating Methods, which is also a good summary. I'm sure there are other ones. Uh, those are just the ones that I happen to know and be able to say uh, they're worthwhile looking at. <coughs> From the creationist uh, standpoint, there's probably one book that stands out above all the others, and that's the two-volume uh, work, Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth, 2000 and 2005. Um, the two books actually have slight differences with each other in their approach. Um, uh, the second one is probably the more useful one partly because it's more modern and partly because it has the results, more of the results of the, uh, of the studies, whereas the first one was more laying out the uh, background for those results. And uh, 
It, by the way, can be, uh, both volumes can be obtained on the internet for free, uh, can be downloaded, so you can look at them yourself without having to find them in some library somewhere. Although if you're going to be using them a lot, you might as well buy them, support the ICR. Um, <coughs> my own book, Scientific Theology, especially Chapter 5, contains probably the most detailed treatment from an Adventist point of view. It's certainly the most detailed treatment from a point of view that did not assume that radiometric uh, dating content, uh, constants have changed. Um, and it's still pretty accurate, although obviously it's about 15 years out now. Um, and there is one article that I, I mentioned in my book, but uh, I think that deserves special treatment because it was written by Robert Gentry and it got into science. And it's pretty straightforward in its, um, in its implications, and we're going to cover that towards the end of our talk. Uh, we've covered it some in uranium lead dating uh, as well. Then there are a couple of articles by Jenkins and Fischbach, 2008. Um, and uh, they have to do with the change in radiometric decay constants, which is a very interesting subject. And uh, they support their, uh, their uh, conclusions by data pretty well. Um, the theory behind how it might be changed is not well understood. And their proposition may very well be wrong. But the bottom line is that the decay constants do appear to change in rational, uh, for uh, at least in predictable ways. So um, there are about 76 methods. Obviously, we're not going to review them all. And there's probably a few more that have been invented since that list was made. And some of them are like uh, using tritium, hydrogen-3, as a dating method. And of course, that won't work for uh, the ages that we're talking about. So after you pair those down and pair the ones out that are, are kind of failed methods, according to them, you get to what are the common methods, and I'll just go over them. But uh, carbon-14, of course, which deserves its own talk, and uh, we've given it already. Potassium-argon, argon-argon, which is basically a variant of potassium-argon. Uranium-lead, and there's several different uranium-lead methods, which could have been detailed together. Rubidium-strontium, samarium-neodymium, rhenium-osmium, and um, kind of an odd bird uranium disequilibrium, which again, uh, is that's separate from most of the others, and we'll come back to them in a minute. There are what are usually considered to be failed methods, uh, some of which probably are failed methods, but some of which may very well be failed methods because they don't give the right ages, they give them much too low and beryllium-10 and amino acid dating being uh, two of those. Um, Pleochroic halos are failed for another reason. Uh, as we've looked at them, we've found uh, halos that don't fit the standard model very well. Um, whether they're created in situ or whether they are caused by massive floodwaters containing radon percolating through uh, granite, is hard to say, but in any case, they don't fit a model where granite is just sitting there behaving itself. And then uh, there are uh, dating systems that I consider to have mostly a wax nose. That is to say, they can be pointed any direction you want to, magnetic reversal being the worst of them. Magnetic reversal is either positive or negative. Uh, it's either the way we have it now or it's reversed. If you get something that won't fit, 
you just say there was a reversal there. Uh, I, I have a hard time making too much of it, and in fact, that's true for the uh, uh, for uh, people who are uh, long ages. They have a hard time making too much sense of it as well. Uh, and then there's fission track dating. Uh, what counts as fission tracks gets very dicey in certain uh, elements or certain uh, uh, minerals. And uh, again, you can get date, any date you want out of it, which uh, kind of makes it not too helpful. Potassium argon and argon argon, to be very brief, I think that uh, Adventist scientists should know what the method is, um, what the general principles are, and um, how well it works and how well it doesn't work. Uh, potassium decays to argon. You measure the potassium, you measure the argon, you do a little um, a sidestep to account for argon that happens to be uh, derived from air. Um, and you get a date. Uh, it can give reasonable dates. My understanding is that uh, we've used some of it at the Pisco Formation in uh, uh, Peru. And that the dates, you get older dates lower down in the strata and, higher, and younger dates higher up in the strata. And they kind of more or less match what you'd expect from a uh, uh, from a standard geological point of view. So sometimes you get the right answers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they sometimes give you the wrong answers, uh, clearly the wrong answers, such as uh, lava flow that was witnessed in 1910 being dated to 40 million years. Somehow nobody's going to quite believe that. Uh, the question is, what? Uh, how do you explain the old dates? How do you explain the young dates? And um, is there any particular material that, if it looks just the right way, you can depend on that date? Um, the answer, as far as I can tell, is no, that you are still dependent on filtering the dates. And we'll talk about that later. And it's of interest that argon-argon dating was developed precisely because potassium-argon dates weren't giving the right dates. Argon-argon dates still have their own problems, both with reproducibility and <coughs> with the theory, because in argon-argon, you're actually measuring the stuff that's on the very inside of a crystal, which is the part which is least likely to let go of its argon. And you have, to, uh, you have to start with zero argon, or at least argon that matches air argon, in order for this method to work. Argon-argon produces more dates, which allows a better chance of obtaining the right date. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, if I'm uh, sending over a lab and I can get all kinds of uh, values, um, some of which will be therapeutic and some of which will not, it doesn't increase my confidence to know that uh, blood samples that were sent five minutes apart with no change in the patient have wildly different uh, values. Um, somehow that seems to me more of a disadvantage than an advantage. Um, <coughs> There is a whole set of, of methods, uranium lead, rubidium strontium, samarium neodymium, and rhenium osmium, all of which depend on one, and the way I've listed the parent is first, um, uh, uh, one isotope being radioactive and decaying away, and you measure the amount of the parent isotope that's left, and you measure the amount of the daughter isotope, but the problem with these ones is that the daughter isotope is not volatile. And so if you melt a rock, the strontium, for example, won't vaporize and go off into a, uh, the air somewhere. It will instead be in 
the middle. So for all of these, you have to detect how much strontium-87 or uh, neodymium, I've forgotten what the number is, there is left. And in order to do that, you have to use something called an isochron, which is to measure the parent, daughter, and a reference isotope in various rocks and find ratios. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details if you want to look those up. They're well detailed in any of the uh, texts that I mentioned, including my own work. Um, <coughs> they can give what are apparently good ga dates. Uh, some of the dates can be problematic. What proportion is good and what proportion is problematic is not clear. Um, I can't tell you that 80% of them are good or 50% of them are good. I rather suspect that it's not 20% of them are good because I think if it was that bad, people wouldn't use the dating method. And, um, but um, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, mixing lines can precisely imitate, imitate isochrons. And so what often happens is that if you get a date that you don't believe, you check to see if it's a mixing line. Well, of course, what you should do then is if you get a date that you do believe, you should check to see if it's a mixing line too because maybe that's not good either. But that's not commonly done. The uh, uranium disequilibrium dates um, are, are done in a slightly different manner. They're used for relatively recent date. They don't give you millions of years, but they do give you thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they depend on a complex equation, actually several complex equations, which cannot be solved for time. And so you have to do iterations in order to make it, uh, in order to find the, the date. However, that does not mean that they would not work because you can still approximate the date using, uh, using the equations. Um, that's just to say I'm not going to try to explain what those equations are because they take some thought. Um, again, you can find the equations in any of the good books. Um, they can give good dates. Uh, there's a series um, by um, Bard et al. on corals from, uh, uh, I believe it's the Bahamas. See the Bahamas or Bermuda, uh, somewhere in the Atlantic, and um, uh, some dates that are very, very good. They make sense. They, uh, the older they're supposed to be, the older the date is. Um, they disagree with the carbon fourteen dates from Sugiyatsu, but um, uh, the Bard people say Sugiyatsu is no good. So. Um, they can also give bad dates. There's several instances of that in the literature, and they have explanations for why the dates are bad. The problem, again, is, well, if you use those explanations for the bad dates on the good dates, do they work? And uh, it seems to me like uh, uh, there may be a problem there. Some experiments that should be done, and one in particular that I proposed in uh, my book, Scientific Theology, I tried to find a laboratory who can do it, and there were only two laboratories in the world who did that particular kind of date. And uh, the one that was conveniently in Southern California um, has not responded to um, uh, my attempt to try to get the date done. So it's, it's not easy to get some of those experiments done. There are, of course, the failed methods, beryllium-10, pleochroic halos, and amino acid dating. I've talked about beryllium-10 before. Uh, we find, among other things, uh, I, a normal amount of beryllium-10 in uh, uh, material that's supposed to be 18 million years old, and it's kind of hard to believe that when it should be like one uh, thousandth or less the uh, amount of beryllium-10 we have today. Um, 
Amino acid dating is generally considered a failed method. It has a star behind it because it's not technically a radiometric date. But it is an absolute dating method. Should give you good dates, in fact doesn't. Um, as um, Dr. Bob Brown pointed out, those dates are too young. In fact, that's known from the secular literature as well. And um, that has interesting implications. And then there's pleochroic halos, which uh, kind of uh, nobody uses them much anymore, even though theoretically they could be used for radiometric dating. Um, and in fact, we're going to get into that in, uh, as one of the ignored uh, points. These methods give consistently two young ages or suggest very unusual processes, and because of that, uh, uh, most scientists don't find them rewarding and don't pay too much attention to them. They're not used in standard geology. Um, I have a feeling that carbon-14 may soon join those if the data that we have continues to be obtained. but. Uh, Um, and then there's the wax nose ones, fission tracks and magnetic reversal. I've talked a little bit about magnetic reversal. It's probably the worst one. It's hard to use it for dating when, uh, you know, if either uh, magnetic points north or points south and uh, um, it's, it's hard to say, well, this points to this particular era because there are multiple things that can point to that era in multiple time slots in the conventional dating scale. And fission track dating possibly could also be used to falsify short age without accelerated decay. And in fact, that was one of the uses that it was put to during the RAID project. Uh, suggesting that there had to be accelerated decay or else that the uh, specimens had to be quite old. Um, the problem with fission track dating is that it's hard to, to determine ahead of time what are tracks and what are not tracks. And, uh, you know, if you don't like the date, you just say that the tracks have been annealed and then that takes care of a, a short age date. There are some remarkably short age dates that are sometimes obtained by fission track. Uh, some of the ignored data from the standard perspective that people should probably be aware of, one of them is uh, John Woodmerappy, whose book came out shortly after mine, interestingly enough. Um, the Mythology of Modern Dating Methods simply is a huge collection of dates that don't fit. Now, the problem that I have with this book, although it's, it's a very nice collection, is that I don't know what the denominator of his data is. If I if I knew that we could say, well, 20% of the dates are trash or 50% um, or it's really 80% and they eliminate uh, most of the dates by making sure that it won't fit, um, then I think we could um, make more of that. As it is, I think what we can say is that um, radiometric dating isn't quite as good as um, it's normally cracked up to be. There are, of course, the failed methods which are usually ignored and I think um, should be put back in. And I think that includes uh, carbon-14 in that. There's the Gentry et al. Uh, 1976 uh, science article that we talked about earlier and I'm going to go through that very simply. There are polonium halos because they have squashed halos, normal halos, and normal halos with squashed halos it's very arguable that they are in place very close to the time of coal formation. You can say within 10 years. At the same time, uranium halos, which are in place apparently at ex the exact same time, are immature, having very little or no lead in them. And the published data will tell you that, that uh, the lower limit of dating is something less than 300,000 years. Uh, Gentry has said in a video that it's less than 100,000 years and he may have data that 
that uh, uh, that is not published so that I can't tell you exactly. Um, but it may be less than 100,000 years, but it's certainly less than 300,000 years. And considering that this means that the coal was formed, it was in place ten in, within 10 years, and the halos give you an age of less than 300,000 years, uh, and this is supposed to be Cretaceous material, which is over 65 million years, that kind of puts strain on um, a standard geologic time scale. There are changes in radiometric decay constants, which are even more interesting. Um, Jenkins and Fishbach, in the two articles that I pointed out, the first one talked about uh, 54 manganese decay, which decreased at about the same time as a solar flare. Now, if you go back and look at their data, yes, it's true that that happened, and it may have happened twice. There's a third one where it went down, and there was no obvious solar flare. So something else is going on than just a solar flare. And there's one what looks like a solar flare where it didn't decrease its decay rate. So I'm the connection with the solar flare is not quite as tight as you'd like to have. But in one sense, it doesn't matter. The solar flare is only useful if you try to say that that meant we got a whole bunch of neutrinos. Uh, and if it's not neutrino-based, then uh, maybe there's something else going on that decreases the uh, radioactive decay rate of manganese. And it's particularly interesting because there are people, there were people, in fact, I presented next to somebody and reviewed that person's paper, who said that if the radioactive decay constants were to change, the universe would fall apart. Well, <clears throat> I guess it didn't fall apart in 2006, so. Um, then there's another paper that talks about uh, 32 sil uh, silicon, which was being compared with uh, 36 chlorine, and it varied annually by about 0.3 percent. And there was another um, another uh, one where they were they were using 226 radon uh, radium, excuse me as the standard, and it was being compared with uh, 152 europium. Uh, actually, europium was being compared with it, but then when they went back and looked at the data, the ra radium decay also varied annually by just about the same amount as the silicon. Now, of course, if you're measuring these things as a relative basis, uh, you might actually be seeing the silicon and the chlorine varying with each other. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to see more data as to what the absolute decay rates were before I would say for sure. I think that they're picking on those two isotopes because they varied um, absolutely as well, but it's not explicitly said, especially with the silicon. And it raises the question, if that's really what's going on, why don't the 36 chlorine and the 152 europium also vary by 0.3 percent? And the answer is nobody knows why. But the data is what it is, and it suggests, again, that there is some mechanism that can vary radiometric dating, which has always been felt to be an absolute uh, value that doesn't change with anything except in the case of K-capture, and I think there's one other exception, beta decay in a strong electromagnetic field, with both of which make uh, sense. Um, then, most of the time, if you go to a standard radiometric dating thing, they will not talk at all about the Ray Project, which I think has several um, uh, papers in it that have data that is are very interesting and difficult to explain from a standard perspective. And I'm thinking particularly of the helium retention in zircons. 
Although, of course, they did some carbon-14 stuff as well, and they did uh, some fish and track dating and a few other things like that that I think needed to be done. We're done, and, and it was good for them to have done it. But in the case of helium retention zircons, uh, according to John Baumgartner, they have found not only that it works in the Hemis granite diorite in uh, New Mexico, but it also works on some other sites as well. Now, I think that that material should be worked up and published because the idea that, that you can take that data and generalize it means that it's a lot harder to ignore. This is not a one-off thing. This is not something that just happened because there's a volcano next door, that in fact this is a common phenomenon where there's more helium in the zircon than there ought to be from standard uh, diffusion characteristics. Uh, there's two other things that I think that people should know. Now, I'm showing you a biased sample, and I'll just tell you that right up front. I'm not showing you the very best case that can be produced, um, because the very best case that can be produced is going to be covered elsewhere by other people. Um, but I am showing you oddities that really shouldn't be ignored, and one of them that is fascinating is the story of Triassic bird tracks in Argentina. Uh, the reference is there, uh, Melkor and Nature, and um, also uh, that you can get the abstract from there, and those of you who have access to Nature can get the whole thing. And there's a communication and a retraction that you can get at that same website. And um, the story is basically they had a feature that was dated to the late Triassic area, both by a kind of wood called uh, Rexoxylon. Uh, I believe that's, uh, maybe it's Rexocylon. Um, uh, but it's a wood that's found only in the late Triassic of uh, uh, Gondwana land, which would be South America, um, Africa. I'm not sure whether Australia is or, or um, uh, are Antarctica is split off at that point, but, but it's only found in that area at that time, and so they thought, aha, we have a date. And so just to be sure, they sent it off to an argon-argon lab, which is the better, supposedly, way of doing potassium-argon dates. And they got 212.5 plus or minus 7 million years. Nice date. Um, and at first they thought, oh, we found a whole bunch of bird-like tracks. There must be some bird-like dinosaurs. As they kept looking at these tracks, they started noticing that some of the tracks were coming in with long thumb marks. Uh, well, it's actually not thumb. It's uh, I've forgotten which, f which digit is turned backwards in birds, but it's the backward digit anyway. So they were, they're, f they're f three digits forward, one digit backward, and the, and the back digits were, were trailing, were coming in and gouging in extra and then coming down, and then the bird would start walking. That means it was a bird. That means it was flying. Uh, all of a sudden, these aren't bird-like dinosaurs. These are birds. They're Triassic. Something is wrong. So what do you do? Well, you redate it with uranium lead. And now it comes out, and unfortunately, the, uh, the I'm sure there's an article that says exactly how old it was, but they just said it was late Eocene, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 million years old. Um, it has to be over 33.9 million years and under. Well, under 50, uh, 54 million years, I think it is, because that's the Eocene age. But so, you know, anyway, well below 212.5 million years. And um, so now we have Eocene birds, and of course they are birds. The only problem with that is you have not only trashed argon-argon dating, you have also trashed 
an index fossil. The other one that's interesting is, um, is detailed somewhat in The Pigs Took It All uh, by Marvin Lubino. And um, uh, that's on the web also. But uh, you can find a more detailed account from his point of view in Bones of Contention at, in the appendix. And you can find uh, treatment giving you the same data, by the way, just looking at it differently. But you look at the data and decide for yourself what you think it means um, at uh, Talk Origins. And you know various places like that. that they obviously they didn't like Lubinow's interpretation, so they gave another one. And I think actually the other one was given first by um, uh, Richard Lewin in a, bone, in a book that also was entitled "Bones of Contention." And um, it's the story of the K. Bernsmeyer site, Tuff, usually called KBS for short, in Kenya. Now, K. Bernsmeyer found this Tuff, and she, and so somebody dated it, in 1969. Fitch and Miller, who are from, the, uh, I think Fitch is from Cambridge, and Miller is from the University of London or vice versa. They're very respectable people, 212 to 230 million years old. Well, that won't fly. So they redid it, and um, actually it's closer to 2.61 million years. Um, so then somebody came up with looking at the pigs, and they said, yeah, 2.6 million years is probably OK guy by the name of Maglio who looked at two pig series and an elephant series and said, Dad, that's probably all, all right. Then in 1972, they found Skull 1470 below this, which meant that Skull 1470 was older. Well, this was wonderful for Richard Leakey, who had now discovered the oldest uh, human skull, or at least passably human skull. Um, but of course, everybody else wasn't too happy about this because the skull shouldn't have been down that low. And so Leakey maintained that it was that old, and the other people maintained it wasn't that old. So, of course, what you do is you redate it. Somebody got into it with Paleo Mag and um, came out with 2.7 to 3.0 million years, which is actually a little further up. That's, you know, the magnetic field matched the correct polarity then. Well, that isn't the end. In 1975, a guy by the name of Cook redid the pig. And he said, no, it's only 1.8 million years old. So then a um, guy by the name of Curtis, who's well known in uh, radiometric dating uh, circles, I think he's from Berkeley, if I remember correctly. Um, did argon argon, and he's he came out with 1.82 million years. Okay, and then uh, fish and track dating people got into it, and they said no, it's really 2.44 million years old, which matched the old style. And um, Fitch and Miller redid their data, and well, really it's not 2.6; it's 2.42 million years old. Um, and then uh, a whole bunch of dates were done in 1980 and 81. A fish and track by Gleedow, which is 1.87 million years. Potassium argon by McDougall, who's another big name in the field, but he's a specialist in fish and track dating, 1.89 million years. Uh, another fish and track by McDougall, 1.88 million years. And then finally, Argon Argon by McDougall, 1.88 million years. And that's where everybody thinks it belongs, 1.8 million years. 1.88 million years. Uh, interestingly, Fitch et al. went back and redid some of their other things. I think it's the same Fitch that was Fitch and Miller. And um, they got a range from 0 0.52 million years to 2.6 million years, so you can take your pick. Uh, 
If I were getting that kind of answers for a pro-time on a patient, I would be concerned. My own take is that there's actually an article out that says this, and they're happy about it because the metaphysical research program is coming out their way, but the radiometric dating isn't really scientific. It's a metaphysical research program. I, I think they may be right. I think there is some order, and we have to be able to account for it, so I think that, uh, or I shouldn't say we have to be able to account for it. I should say that a comprehensive theory has to be able to account for it. But we may not be able to account for any of this stuff. I think there are fudge factors that make the order less impressive than it would otherwise be. I think that except for carbon-14 and uranium lead dating, we don't have a known good creationist model. And unfortunately, in carbon-14, the model directly conflicts with the best uranium lead stuff, or actually I should say uranium helium lead. Uh, they're different models. And so either one of them is incorrect or else the corrections that apply to one don't apply to the other and we have to figure out where the corrections change. Um, it's interesting work. I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, uh, we are not done with this subject. Um, but I would say one last thing before I quit, and that is that do remember that there were people who threw their faith overboard, supposedly because there were 300,000 years at least of deposits in the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. And it didn't turn out to be correct. And so I think that before we just trash everything, we, we are allowed to say, and we should say, we don't know, and we should investigate this further. I think there are enough cracks in the edifice that to simply bow before it, it does not make a lot of sense. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I would like to see somebody fr uh, who is creationist, um, perhaps without making too much of a deal of it, uh, go into radiometric dating, see, you know, how many dates are deviant, how many dates are accurate, what the criteria are for a good date, are they consistently applied? Um, well, radiometric dating itself, like you said, should it, should it become the standard? Because it's supposed to not vary over time. It's supposed to be constant. And theoretically, it's supposed to be constant back billions of years. So that was supposed to be a nice standard. The problem is, is that you have all these problems of contamination and leaching and innumerable different factors that come into play where you can't say that this rock has always been just like this for the last billion years. You, you, and you now we have it even know. worse because we can't be totally sure that the radiometric decay constant. Right, and are then you have this 3.3% variable in the constant itself, but at least that's workable, I mean, but you can't even tell if that rock has not been affected by any outside forces. You just can't know that, so we really have no constant to have a constant reference. We have no reference. And I think the more we learn about this, the more we know that there is no valid reference for these dating methods. Yeah, as a lifelong creationist, and I realize my bias, every science class I took coming up through uh, academy, college, and then here in dental school, every science class I took made me wonder more and more at how God could create all this order. The more I studied, the more I saw order. And I'm not very familiar with all the dating methods and everything. I, I'm not, that's not my field of interest. But as a Christian, I've always had two uh, points of reference that um, are sort of like black boxes because we don't know exactly what happened. One is the flood. We don't know all the forces. We don't know all the... Um, 
activity that went on during that. The Bible doesn't specify exactly, but it gives a general term that there was a quite a bit of upheaval. And the second period of time for me is that in Genesis it says that the earth was out form and void. I don't know exactly what that means, but to me it means there was something here, it just wasn't formed. And so my belief is that the periodic the elements on the periodic table have have been around and God can create any of those at any moment that he wants to. But they have been around and we don't understand all the factors. We have some of the factors, but we don't understand all the factors. I don't know that we ever will on this earth. I know we can study that uh, in the earth to come. But um, to me, it doesn't worry me. Um, it doesn't shake my belief. And looking at the, the dates that they come up with with some of these measurements, I'm just going like, well, you know, that's, that's their theory and I've got mine. What's interesting about this to me personally too, and I, I like the personal testimony, is that there was a point when I went off to the military and I thought maybe this is all bunk, you know, but what's exciting to me is when the science comes down and say, hey, uh, this stuff is actually credible. It's, I don't just have to believe it on a leap of faith. I have some good evidence, some solid evidence for this, and that's why I appreciate Ariel Roth coming back with other methods of, of estimating elapsed time. When you got fresh tissues, including DNA and proteins, sequenceable in dinosaur bones that are supposed to be 65 million years old, you're like, okay. And, 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 and a, the previous year, a paper was published saying sequenceable proteins cannot even, in theory, survive more than 100,000 years. And this is published in science. All right, so the previous year, this is published. And then the next year, you find them in dinosaur bones. It's almost like prophetic. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, oh. Well, uh, who's right then? You know, here you got a definitive statement on the one hand, and then a definitive evidence on the other. Well, of course, the obvious uh, truth is they're both right. Right. <laughs> so then you're like, all right. So a lot of this starts stacking up eventually. Not only is there overwhelming evidence for design in living things, now you got pretty much overwhelming evidence for the time period described by the flood. And then just this year, there's published on there's vast quantities of water in the ocean, in the Earth's crust. That's not, that one percent of it is three times the volumes of all the oceans in the world today. Just one percent. So you got an asteroid hammering into the Earth, smushing up the Earth's crust, and there's like, well, where did all the water come from? There's enormous amounts of water. I mean, this all starts adding together for me. And I was like, where's the evidence really lie? And if it came from the Earth's crust, what would it look like? Fountains of the great deep. Yeah, maybe? bursting open, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Back behind. You know, I think um, we keep touching, science keeps opening a little window here and a little window there, but the, the ability to comprehend the, the mind of God and what he's capable of doing is so far out of our grasp that I think we're, he never gives us quite enough I don't think he can keep our, give our minds enough information for us to truly understand what's going on. So I kind of feel like just those two articles coming out, he plays with it just a little bit. You have to have faith because you're not bright enough to ever figure out what I did. So here, we'll give you a little bit more to have faith on. We'll give you a little bit more information so it becomes terribly obvious at this point that to go with random chance and natural selection is, is getting close to ludicrous at this point from a scientific method. And, but all the things are not answered to us, and I think that's not a matter of being withheld from us. I think that's a matter of our in inability of our finite brains to get close to comprehending. Well, science, we have one down there. Well, science itself doesn't function without a leap of faith. I mean, if you knew everything already, you would need science. You would need a theory. You know, you would just know. And so science itself is dependent on making leaps across things that you don't absolutely know. You're just saying, okay, this is where the evidence is pointing, and so I, the odds are. Uh, but you don't absolutely know, and that's the whole basis of science itself. The, the interesting thing on that whole uh, is, that, is that we... Maybe God wants us to not know everything, 
And part of the test is to find out which side we want to lean towards when the evidence isn't completely convincing either way. And that's, that's how the rest of the universe knows our real character. You know, if you want to find out if this person is honest, you don't put it on a form saying, are you honest? <laughs> you know. That's where my picture comes from. Yeah. Um, that what you do, actually, is you put them in a room and you, and you let them think that nobody's watching. And you put a few thousand dollars or a uh, pretty member of the opposite sex or something like that to just leave them alone and see what they do. You know, and some people respect property rights, you know, respect, uh, <coughs> uh, and some people don't. And the way you find out is by giving them the chance to Whereas uh, the motive, you don't, you can have all the evidence in the world, like r the raised body of Christ, and still deny it, uh, because you have a motive to do so. So there's a difference between having enough evidence for a, a candid mind, versus in having in, uh, somebody who's not honest, who is not going to care about the evidence at all, regardless of what you give them. Yeah, and uh, and all that God is really responsible for is making the evidence lean enough in that direction to where you know where the truth mm -hmm. is. And you know it doesn't fit with the usual desires of a person's heart and you have to choose, are you gonna go that way or are you gonna go this way? And actually leaving it a bit ambiguous gives, it, makes it possible for people to display their true feelings. Whereas if it was so obvious that everybody was looking, well, you know, no, nobody, nobody steals while the policeman is watching, you know. Um, I, it seems like every, every, in every aspect, we see that ultimately the way God does design things is perfectly. And the same way with faith, if we had such evidence that then we wouldn't need faith. I think he's made it so that we have to, you know, look down that chasm and have a leap of faith to the other side to, to be saved. It's going to take some sacrifice on our part, and that's the sacrifice that he, he, he desires from us and, and requires from us. So I don't think we'll ever have that kind of evidence. The, the fact is that the other side doesn't have the evidence either, though, so we may have the preponderance of the evidence. So go ahead. Well, it's not just, I mean, what did the disciples have? They had the resurrected Christ, right, standing, put your finger in my side, blah, blah, blah. So it's not like God is unwilling to give extreme evidence uh, about his claims. He is willing. And we have the Bible, we have prophecy, we have a lot of great evidence. So it's not, not that he wants us to take blind leaps of faith. I think he wants us to take educated leaps of faith and, and with extreme evidence involved, especially when he calls you to extreme action. When we look at the... When you look at the scientific literature, we see um, a bias there that we need to be aware of. And we have half a million scientists trying to interpret nature without God, without creation, without the Bible. It's close to that idea. Uh, you need to keep in mind there's a difference between data and interpretation. Uh, when I look at the data, the hard data of nature, I can almost say uh, the case in favor of God is almost overwhelming. I'm speaking of the origin of life, for instance, and the precise uh, forces of physics and so on. Uh, hard to explain this without, uh, I, it seems to me, but we need to keep in mind the literature, scientific literature is not going to cover that at all. It is close to that. There's a tremendous bias there that we need to keep in mind. <coughs> and we need to keep in mind there's a difference between data and interpretation. But often scientists don't make a difference to dis distinguish clearly between that. I'm going to pass the mic back. Just a quick comment. Uh, the, uh, even the disciples had 
problems believing in Jesus, even though he was, I mean, they believed that he was a person, but he, they didn't understand a lot about him. It took them a long time after he was crucified to, and resurrected even. They still didn't believe. Doubting Thomas, even they see it, they believe. This is the, the nature of human beings. God's not People that are waiting for absolute evidence before they become Christians are going to be waiting their lifetime, and that's going to be too late for them. So that's my point. I think it's interesting. The original problem, as I understand it, for Satan was pride, and I think that in the example of the re resurrected Christ, the people that had condemned him would have to humble themselves and say that they were wrong, and I think God repeatedly uh, points out the fact that he's the creator and we're the created and he asked Job where were you when I did these things I think that part of this gets back to whether we're willing to accept our finiteness and humble ourselves and realize we're created not the creator and, and be willing to take some things on faith but pride interferes repeatedly throughout history with that um. This last week, I was at the funeral of my mother, and I threw dirt on her coffin. Well, I put also flowers. But I mean, I was physically involved in the actual interment of her body into the ground. Yet I come home and the fact that she's gone somehow does not feel real. You, you notice I said does not feel real. Intellectually I understand it, but on a personal level it, it hasn't sunk in. It feels like it will probably take a while for that to happen. Now, we're all familiar with the phenomenon of <laughs> optical illusions. We've seen examples of it. And we're now keenly aware, intellectually aware, that it is possible to see something and feel this got to be right. And then you measure it, and it's wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yes, exactly. Now, how about concepts on a philosophical level that fall into the same realm, which are philosophical illusions, or metaphysical illusions, or something like this, which just feel they got to be right? And, and we're willing, I mean, people would probably be willing to go to war over it. And yet, if examined closely, <laughs> there is no foundation for it. So, I've been thinking a lot about the Judgment Day. I used to believe that the Judgment Day should be the great conversion story of everybody because all the evidence has been laid out. I would expect everybody who was not convinced before at least to be convinced like Doubting Thomas. Well, my Lord and my God, amen. End of story, well, yes. As a matter of fact, the, the statement that every knee shall bow suggests that they will be convinced. Y yes, but you see, this is the problem here. It's not just an intellectual problem. <laughs> this is an issue, isn't it? It is what have we embraced? I know. And what have we chosen to attach ourselves to? And it's not a problem of truth. That's what my whole point is. It's not a problem of evidence. God has no problem offering up all the evidence you need. The problem is your motive and not do you have a love of truth. And that's it. That's what's going to separate everybody at the end. It's those who love the truth and those who hate the truth. And God is truth. 
So it's going to end up being, do you love God or you do, do you not? Love the reality of what God offers. The reason why I am a believer is, uh, is that my, my creator has given me a power of choice. You see, I could be sitting and watching television and, uh, and uh, Hollywood takes over, you see. Or I have the choice to study this Bible you see, or whatever else that gives me the reason for faith. Um, and, and, and that's what is all about. M what really hurts is that even last night I was listening to some young people, you know, the sun is going down, and I was in this house, well, turn off the TV, you know, so turn off the TV. But even then, what they were doing afterwards, this is our future. See, uh, and uh, we, we grew up, Friday evening, great time, we are members of a movement, the Lord is coming, you know, and the kids uh, don't watch TV, but their thoughts are still into what Hollywood is pouring out. See, Satan already knows uh, that he is a defeated foe, so he says, well, he hates us because he sees us in his image. And so he says, well, I cannot do anything to you at the cross or even whatever else, but I'm going to uh, get even with you by deceiving the created beings. Um, and we feel, you know, I love my church, the movement, more than the church, but I love the movement, and it's not going to be defeated, we know, but how he's going to turn this around is really something that's, going to be fascinating because um, it's, we're not going to be defeated. It's impossible that the Lord's movement is going to be defeated in this world. But how he can do this is uh, going to be something very fascinating to see. Having said that, I have a question for you. Uh, he says amino acid method cannot be used. Uh, why not? Because it gives the wrong answers. The evolution? Yes. Right, right. That's the question. <laughs> Wrong answer because they do not, uh, to start with, all these methods do not ever uh, agree with each other. So why can't they? Uh, amino acids, why is it going to be thrown out? You mean to say they're not concordant? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, from, a, from a different perspective, you say it's giving the right answers and the other ones are not. I think there's another factor involved. When we believe in God, when we believe in Jesus who died for our sins, then we owe him devotion and he has a right to tell us how we should live. And I think there are many who don't want to give him that devotion and they don't want to say that he has a right to tell us what's the best way for us to live because he created us. Well, I think there's one more factor that's really important, too, and that is that sometimes we don't realize that what he tells us is for our own good. And uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't that God's a proud guy and he wants it his way, you know. It's that he's been through this before. And in fact, in the person of Jesus, he's literally been through this before. And he knows what works and what doesn't work. And when he tells us to do things, it's for a good reason. And you know, I get back to the, the, the problem of what do you do with people who, let's say, don't respect sacred hours. There's not much you can do except ignite enough of a fire to where they want to get close to the sacred person. And then the Sabbath, instead of becoming a day when you have to quit all the things you want to do, it becomes a day in which you get to set aside all those other things that would otherwise crowd in on you and then and get to spend some time actually talking with God and listening to God and you know uh, I mean uh, yeah uh, what would people yeah it's it's calling the Sabbath a delight but it's also calling it's also realizing that work is something that in most cases gets in the way of yes. the Sabbath. Gets in the way of more your time with God, if you like to put it that That's way. Right. And the, the ability to just say no, 
this is, you know, this one we're going we're gonna to stop. But if you don't want to get to know God, then there, there's no point in keeping the Sabbath at that point. That there's no, fine. you know. Um, and I think that once people realize that it's, it's that kind of a thing where you have the privilege, then they're going to take advantage of it as much as they can. If they find themselves drifting to other topics, it'll be, why am I going there? What, do I like this better than talking to God and listening to God? Um, the uh, well, one thing I was going to mention before was that another important thing is, like as Jesus said, without an ego was mentioned. That's 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 a good point. I, I think I just want to add to that that when Jesus said, "You must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven," that's part of it too. There's an innocence in the kind of faith God wants. And then the other point is that we can we can do things out of duty, but God wants our heart. And so I like your point, and I make that point too. That because uh, me as as a pre Christian, which I spent most of my life as, um, nobody ever explained to me that those things in the Bible were for our benefit. And I wish that they had. Because that would have made sense, too. Because I, I even, I believed that God was a loving God. And, but too many times the people I saw weren't representing um, that aspect as much as maybe they could have. Well, I think uh, we'll close for now, and, and we'll see you, uh, those of you who can come next week, and um, don't forget the potluck on the 19th. Uh, uh, I understand there's been considerable planning put into it, and I, I think it will be enjoyable. And uh, next week we will talk about ice cores.